So, welcome to TV Savalis. I'm here with the lovely sister Toya. Thank you, thank you. Um, I want to say, first of all, thank you for being a part of this. I appreciate you for your time. And uh, I know you got a lot going on, so we're going to get right to the questions. <laughs> all right, I know you have no idea what I'm going to ask you. I do not. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so, first, let's just uh, say, I've seen that you travel out the States before. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. You're traveling outside of the country. Where have you been? Well, recently this year, I went to, um, I was blessed to be able to go to Paris and London for my birthday okay. in February. So my cousin and I, we actually planned the trip in about five weeks. Okay. Um, I had been wanting to go to Paris for the longest. Um, everybody that I asked that, you know, could they go? Did they want to go? They're like, oh, yeah. And then you know how people just back out at the last second or when the deposit is due. <laughs> right, right. And so, um, talked to my cousin. We went to the Lauryn Hill concert on New Year's Eve. Talked to her about it. I said, I know it's, you know, the last minute. But she was like, nope, I'm interested. Uh, she really planned the whole thing, okay. most of it herself. But, yeah, went there. Paris and London, that was amazing. Um, I've been to... Jamaica, I've been to Cancun, and that's about it as far as being out of the country. But I do travel a lot within the United States as well. Um, Reese, so your passports, let's talk about passports because you've been um, out the country. Yes. And uh, especially for African Americans, we seem like uh, we don't want to get passports, we don't want to leave the country. Exactly. So, how was the process of getting a passport? So I actually got my uh, passport the first time, I think in 2006 oh, so you've or been, seven when, yeah. You've been a world traveler. Yeah, I, well, <laughs> I have, I've had my passport. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I think right at the time I got my passport in 2007, my cousin, the same cousin and I, we went to Jamaica first and um, then Cancun. So, um, but yeah, I think that. Uh, the African-American perspective on getting a passport and flying out of the country. I think it just goes back to um, just like having Southern grandparents because my grandmother, my grandfather used to say stuff like, oh, I'm not going overseas or, you know, right, you got to right. be careful about yeah. going overseas. I get them shots. Right. <laughs> and just the people and not knowing and just having that fear. And, you know, I'm sure that can just be traced back to a lot of things. You know, it's coming from the South, but yeah, I think that it's it's um, it's a good thing, and I see it more that Black people are expanding their, you know, trying to expand their their culture and get you know out of the country more. And I'm a part of a you know a couple of groups on Facebook that focus on travel, and one of them focuses on African Americans. So it's really good to see that Black people do travel, yes, and yeah. they do have passports. So. I just got my uh, baby daughter. She's four months old. We just got her um, passport. So the whole family has passports now. Nice. We're ready to go. Exactly. <laughs> I want to get my granddaughter's passports as well. So that's wonderful. Uh, traveling. So you learn different cultures, different experiences. Um, so let's kind of get into why I uh, contacted you about even doing this. Because I feel like what you're doing spiritually um, on social media is it's a need. And um, so... Let's first talk about like your um, journey in ministry. Where did your love for God come from? Was it as a child? Mm -hmm. well, well, that's a very good question. As I ha never have been asked that question before, but I, it seems like I've rehearsed the answer in my mind. Um, very young age. I, um, I always say when I was about five years old, um, I was raised by my grandmother. Um, both of my, my parents were in and out of jail and used drugs. So my grandmother raised me. Um, my maternal grandmother passed away when I was four. And so she'd ask my father's mother to take me if something ever happened to me. Um, tap, sorry, happened to her. And so that's what she did. And so I lived with my grandmother um, out, you know, in this area from the time I was five years old until I was 18. And so she would always walk through the house and quote scriptures or sing a piece of a spiritual song or a church song. But every time she would say the name Jesus, it was like my spirit would perk up. And it was literally, I felt like, the, I remember the first time I heard it, I, I felt like, oh, I, 
I know him. Uh, it felt it he it felt familiar. I'm like, huh? <laughs> and so it was strange to me. But every time that she would quote a scripture or sing a song, I intently listened, and it was very intentional on my part. Like I liked for her to do so. So that was the first time that I really heard the name Jesus. I was really about five years old, and just different things progressed for me. Um, as I got older, but as a child, I think a lot happened spiritually, and I know that God will draw us to Him. Certain certain people, in, especially starting at a young age, the enemy starts at a young age with his tactics as well. But yeah, very young age, I perked up when I heard His name. So that's um, not unusual, but that's interesting. So, did you have any? Ex I'm say out of body experiences or experiences um, as a child because of uh, your grandmother and, and Just learning or what? knowing, starting to know, getting to know yeah. God or Jesus. Actually, I had a couple. I will say that um, I recognize now that I had the spirit of uh, the gift of discerning of spirits when I was very young. Like I would just know things. When grown-ups were talking, I would just always kind of know what they were talking about. I could sense things um, were going to happen and before they did, and then I would see that it happened and just be surprised or amazed. <laughs> I wouldn't, well, not even really surprised. I liked it. It didn't scare me. I was just like, oh, that's, that's cool. But I remember the first time that I heard the um, audible voice of God, I was eight years old. And I wrote about this in my book that I'm that I've been working on forever <laughs> that I'm going to complete. But um, it was just really simple. But it was Christmas time. And I had, you know, they say, make your list for Santa Claus. And I wanted a bike. So Christmas morning came and I was looking under the tree. No bike. Mm. And I had all these other things that I didn't ask for. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still looking for my bike. Right. I'm like, well, this, I, I got a, bat, a baton and some other stuff. And I'm just like, I don't, what am I going to do with this? I don't want this. Right. Why didn't I get what I asked for? Because I heard my grandmother say, ask and you shall receive. Mm -hmm. So I asked. Right, so I literally. was expecting. <laughs> right. Because, and I said, I always try to refer back to that as an adult. Because when you pray, and you've been praying for something for a long time and you don't get it, it you're, you know, it, it just takes forever to come. I always try to refer back to that, that, you know, believe and come to him as a child. But so Christmas morning came and went and I'm still hoping and believing. I'm like, well, maybe it's coming tomorrow or maybe it's somewhere else because I asked for this bike. Right. You so, got to come. I asked God and you said that the, she told me, my grandmother told me that if I ask you, then I shall receive it. So next morning came. Now, I wasn't upset. I was just really literally confused. I was just like, well, I asked you, right. but it's not here. And um, I was disappointed. And so what I did was I remember sitting on my grandmother's couch and I literally said, um, why didn't it come? Right, or right. I want my bike. And I, as plain as day, I heard sometimes when you ask, the answer is not always yes. You should be whole. You shouldn't expect somebody else to heal you. Only God can do that. And to come in with the right perspective, marriage is compromised. It's supposed to. It's supposed <laughs> to be. <laughs> it's supposed to be selfless, right? right. Now. I'm single, but mm -hmm. you know, God still gives me wisdom on some things mm -hmm. because he's preparing me. So why wouldn't he? Because mm -hmm. some people feel like, oh, you're not married, so you can't, you know, you can't say anything. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Because God still mm -hmm. gives you wisdom. He has to prepare you for what he's going to give you. And so I don't believe that people take the time to heal. People don't take the time to deal with their trauma they don't take the time to, and i mean heal in every area financial healing learn get how to budget <laughs> right get your credit together because you don't want to come into a marriage with everything in shambles and finances are one of the the i think the number one reason that people get divorced mm. and so 
you know, Christian principles. I think people are just kind of shying away from church principles because they feel like, or godly principles, because it's, they feel like it's too restricted. And it, and, and that's probably been forever, since forever. But you also may have sometimes churches that are like that. They're very restrictive. Right. They don't really talk to you freely and openly and are not transparent. And it's more like a just don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. You mm -hmm. know, it's not giving any understanding, not giving any wisdom or knowledge to try to help people navigate. So there's a myriad of reasons why, you know, people, <laughs> divorce work. can right. happen in relationships. But I think one of the number one reasons, people don't respect marriage like they used to. Right. They enter into it. You have shows, 90 Day Fiance, yeah, right, which right. is a hot mess. <laughs> For TV, right, right. But they're they're on there trying to get a check, but you can see the value or the lack of right. for relationships. And people are broken, like the brokenness that you see in people. They're like, what makes you? What would make you fly all the way around the world <laughs> to meet to marry somebody you don't even know? Right. And then you find, um, and I marriages can happen quickly. I know that God can it doesn't take God long to do what he's gonna do but nobody's waiting to hear really like God is this you know is this the person I know when I get married it'll be something that happens quickly I'm prepared for that he's already told me but I know that he will do things to confirm mm -hmm. so it won't be entered into lightly but yeah lack of respect lack of values and lack of um, healing hey I couldn't have said it better. That's why y'all gotta go follow Sister Toya on her table talks. Y'all need to uh, tune in, definitely. My last question for you, thank you once again for your time. How do you balance being a woman of God with everything else you got going on and your morals as far as uh, dating and just living a regular life or just working and doing your everyday routine? How do you balance it all? It's extremely difficult. I um, often ask the question myself, <laughs> how am I doing it? Because I, um, I have a, a master's degree in, in social work. So I've worked with um, in social services for nearly 20 years. I have two, two sons, 28 and 18, and um, have been a single mom. And meaning I'm not in a relationship with the fathers, but also my youngest son I raised him completely by myself and so that's not it's not it's not easy I've had to cry pray scream holler you mm. know cry out to God um, but the Holy Spirit you know just keeps pushing me you know we have our moments we have our downtime we have our breaks because you know people would consider me a very strong person because I've been through a lot I've handled a lot I've shouldered a lot but you know, you also have to check on your strong friends mm. because everybody has a breaking point. So there's been many breaking points, <laughs> much prayer. Um, I actually had my youngest son when I was in graduate school getting my master's degree. And um, over Christmas break, I couldn't have planned it better if I had <laughs> planned it, <laughs> which I did not. <laughs> but you know, it just, God is always there. He's always there. He's always, you know, shown himself. Um, you know, we all get to low points. Like I said, it's hard to raise a child or um, just do life by yourself exactly. for the most part. But, you know, relationships, I um, began a celibacy, uh, in, uh, abstinence journey. I, I switched from celibacy because I have not taken a vow of celibacy forever. But abstinence I started practicing abstinence um, almost 10 years ago and because you know as far as relationships go when you're single and you're trying to live right it's very difficult so I got tired of just being in situationships mm. that just ended up just being sex situationships it's just Man, you know that's not a bad word <laughs> it I ain't gonna say it no more <laughs> Like a tongue twister. Put some respect on her name. It is. <laughs> but you know, I got tired of being objectified. I got tired of just, you know, it that's the end result. You don't want me, but you want you want sex with me. Right, right. And so, you know, that's that's very hard. And I'm a person that has that has been molested and raped as a child. So, 
you know, all of those things that that cause, of course, trauma and other things in relationships and you looking for love in all the wrong places. And so I had to um, God kind of tapped me on my shoulder. He had been for months, but I had because I had been thinking about it and I just got a confirmation one day. And somebody was just like um, a miss, spiritual mentor of mine. She was like, you know, God said, stop, stop having sex. And I'm like, I said, wow, you gave everybody else in this car a word of encouragement. <laughs> and then that's what he told me to do. So, but I, he had already been tapping me on the shoulder. So I started that almost 10 years ago. It's not been easy, but it's been worth it. And so I have to, I'm still learning how to set boundaries as far as relationships are concerned and just kind of, you know, steer away and, and see the red flags mm. early on yeah. and not just let them go and compromise and be like, ah, uh, I'm going to let this, let this slide or let this end. But I've learned more and more how important it is to, you know, be very selective, to have a high standard. And that's a high standard according to what God has for us. He wants us to have his best. He wants me to have his best. But I haven't always wanted my his best for me. Mm. I didn't always understand that, hey, like that he really does love me and care for me. And so that's been a process that I've, you know, um, learned and walked through and gotten to know God more as father during the process of being abstinent. And, you know, people might be like, oh, you, she's abstinent. She's not doing anything. I can't talk to her. You know, people get kind of scared, kind of frigid. Nah, or or <laughs> men think that they can flip you, <laughs> which is either one or the other. They're like, oh, I respect that, but I'm not messing with you. <laughs> like you're a leper almost sometimes because people will do that, too. Or they'll think that, oh, OK, and they think that they can flip you. But I'm like, nah, it doesn't work like that. So, you know, it's been very difficult on, on both ends. Single parenthood, balancing it all, work, school, because you only have so much time in a day. And then trying to do what God has for you to do. Well, I'll just keep encourage you, encouraging you to uh, balance it out, do the best you can do. It looks like you've been doing a phenomenal job. I seen your son yesterday at the college. <laughs> uh, yes, thank he's you. He's doing very well. Way. And, uh, I know that uh, you're proud of him and, you, and your oldest son as well. And so, um, yes. once again, I want to thank you for this interview. Thank you for this time. And do you have any last words you want to uh, let the people know? Anything as far as social media or anything that you're doing right now? Oh, sure. Want to promote? Well, you can follow me on um, Facebook at Latoya Simone. And on Instagram, it's the Latoya Simone. Just T H E, Latoya Simone. Um, and I'm getting ready, I'm getting, you know, my website done and getting some, you know, business things in order, which God told me to prepare for throughout the rest of this year. So I can, you know, head into 2020, hit the ground running and just, you know, see what the Lord has for me. So I'm, I'm possibly going to do, um, a webinar or either a brunch for the table, um, and, uh, working on a retreat. So I want to combine my love for travel and my love for encouragement and empowering people, empowering women. So working on that for 2020 also. But follow me. Many blessings and uh, keep going, sister. Thank you so much, Shabalas. <laughs> All right, thanks.